Okay, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody. Welcome to the Increasing NASA Earth Science Data Accessibility with GIS Earth Data Webinar. This is your host, Jennifer Brennan. It is 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time, so we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, what I'll do first is begin today's webinar with just a few logistics. To ensure the best audio experience, all participants have been placed in silent mode, but if you have any issues or you have any questions, please enter those into the Q&A panel rather than the chat, and you should see that located on the right side of your screen. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording will be posted both to the NASA Earth Data website and also to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel within a few days of completion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, once completed, what I will do is I'll send an email to all registrants with the recording links and a link to the presentation slide deck as well as demos that were used within today's webinar. As far as timing is concerned, today's webinar will be one hour long with 45 minutes allocated to the presentation and live demonstration and an additional 15 minutes for the question and answer period. During today's webinar, we have seven speakers. So what I'm going to do is uh, introduce all seven now, and then I'll pull up a slide which will show you the agenda lineup for our speakers. Okay, so our first speaker today is Leah Schweizer. She is the Earth Science Data Systems GIS team lead. Our second speaker is Allison Alcott. She's a member of the Earth Data GIS team and also a scientific programmer at NASA's Goddard Earth Sciences Data and Information Services Center, or Just Disk. The third speaker is Brian Tisdale. He is the Earth Data GIS project lead and also is located at one of our data centers at the NASA Atmospheric Science Data Center. Heidi Christensen will be up after that from the Earth Data GIS team and also a senior GIS specialist at the NASA Alaska Satellite Facility Distributed Active Archive Center or ASF DAC. And let's, uh, because we've got seven, we gotta pull up our next set of speakers here. Okay, up on deck next will be Shri Vinay. He is an Earth Data GIS team member. He is also a systems engineer at the Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, or CDAC. Then we've got Patrick Rea. He's an Earth Science Data Systems GIS team member. And last but not least, Genevieve Studer-Ellis, who is an Earth Data GIS project coordinator. And then the next slide here is going to show you the agenda lineup for our speakers. Okay, and I do have just a I'm going to give just a second here so you can check this out and I have a few more um, logistics I want to go over really quickly for you all and then we'll get started. Okay, so de excuse me. So depending upon the volume of questions that are received, we will extend the Q&A period an additional 15 minutes from ed time for those of you who can stay on the line, but we will have a hard cutoff of 3.15 p.m. And then just a final note about the Q&A, we do have a, a large uh, registration for today's event. We'll try to answer all the questions within the time allotted, but if we are not able to address your question during Q&A, our speakers will be able to follow up with you offline. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and introduce today's first speaker, Leah Schweizer. So if you could give me just one second here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. All right. Well, hello, and again, thank you so much for joining us today to learn how we are increasing NASA Earth Data Accessibility with Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. So as Jennifer alluded to, we do have um, an agenda today. So the quick rundown of what we'll be covering is that we'll introduce you to the team before diving into a short overview of Earth Data. We'll jump into GIS and our newly implemented solution, followed by four demonstrations, and then provide you with a glimpse at our roadmap Lastly, we'll highlight resources and ways to get in touch to provide feedback on our efforts. As Jennifer showed earlier, um, you'll be hearing from seven team members today, and we all support various teams across NASA Earth Science Data Systems from across the United States. I'm going to first hand it over to Allison to provide you with a brief Earth Data Overview. Thanks, Leah. All right, Earth Data provides data products from many satellites, including those shown here. 
which are stored at Distributed Active Archive Centers, or DACs, and these data products are also available at earthdata.nasa.gov. Next slide. There are petabytes of data that are stored in these DACs all across the country, and each DAC generally focuses on a specific theme, such as atmospheric science, oceanography, climate, or land surface. The ArcGIS DAC collaboration includes representatives from many of the DACs to facilitate the use of Earth data products in GIS software. Next slide. Over time, the demand for NASA Earth science data has focused more on climate and measuring climate change over time. There is also an increasing focus on the interdependency of different Earth systems, often involving the combination of data sets from different data centers. We have been working to make the data more accessible worldwide, as well as make it more understandable and transparent to the general public and broadening the user community. Next slide. Increased data accessibility also contributes to NASA's mission to transform to open science. This will shorten the time it takes for users to find the data that they need and documentation in order to use the data. Open science also fosters a community to share knowledge and engage more with the data, leading to more innovation and engagement. Back to Leah for a description of GIS. Thanks, Allison. So what's all the hype about and why are we here today to talk about GIS? Within NASA Earth Science, GIS is utilized to support the spatial distribution of data products experiment with the integration of new location-based technologies and expand data access news capabilities. Over the years, we've seen significant increase of interest among our users. Our annual customer satisfaction survey has consistently shown us that users prefer to use primary tools to work with NASA data, and those tools rank ArcGIS and QGIS as number one and two. Additionally, we've seen a growth in the user type expanding beyond traditional earth scientists and academia into new areas, including the general public. Exploration in GIS has led to opportunities for ongoing software enhancements, product improvement, and mission partner technical coordination. This includes a recent NASA Space Act agreement with GIS software provider Esri to collaborate on research to improve interoperability and strengthen discoverability within its vast user community. So people may simplify GIS as making maps, but GIS is valuable for a multitude of reasons beyond cartography. Here at NASA, we leverage GIS technology because it allows our data to be seen. Despite its complexity, users can tap into multiple variables and parameters through visualization. It also allows for our data to be integrated with other analysis and visualization platforms and allows for interoperability with other non-scientific data formats to perform overlays and comparisons. GIS provides the ability to deploy powerful spatial-based raster and temporal analytics and promotes our content to be easily discovered, accessed, and used via services, which serve a wide range of clients. Recent enhancements and innovations have lent themselves specifically to science, supporting a variety of data types like NetCDF, to better visualize and analyze spatial trends, patterns, phenomena, and interdependencies, all critical when exploring Earth's systems. Within NASA's Earth Science Division, we see a wide variety of user types, use cases, and workflows. For example, we might have emergency managers that are looking to leverage services to visualize in a desktop or web-based client without having to download any data for situational awareness. We might have GIS analysts who are looking to download data or leverage services to analyze and create cartographic products to then serve with their stakeholders. We might have principal investigators who are looking to use GIS to perform highly interactive algorithms and execute code at scale. We also have scientists who might be looking to leverage online notebooks such as the Jupyter Notebook to collaborate workflows in an interactive web-based environment. We also might have developers that employ code to perform mathematical and analytical fun functions, as well as develop applications to serve their user communities. Our goal is to better serve and enable each of these users. One of the ways we're doing this is to create and publish GIS-ready content 
primarily geospatial web services. We're accomplishing this through our recent deployment of an enterprise Earth Data GIS solution. I'll turn it over to Brian Tisdale to provide more information. Thanks, Leah. Next slide, please. So to support the GIS's community's increasing demand for access to NASA Earth data, we've deployed Esri's ArcGIS Enterprise Suite. This serves as a centralized, scalable, shared resource for the program to provide a common foundation to build upon. This includes, but is not limited to, the ability to publish data as OGC compliant data services, as well as support many common geospatial tools and libraries. Next slide. I'm pleased to announce that today, Earth Data GIS is accessible to you at gis.earthdata.nasa.gov. Here you'll find geospatial ready data and services and applications. Uh, many are featured on the homepage. You see some of those in the screenshot highlighted here. And you can also explore the gallery for additional uh, services. I'll now turn it back over to Leah and the team who are gonna provide you demonstrations of these capabilities. Thanks, Brian. So we have four demonstrations teed up today, all leveraging different services and different tools to show some example workflows. First, we'll start with Heidi from the Alaska Satellite Facility, who will be demonstrating Sentinel coherence data in a web browser and web map. Next, we'll have Sri Vignier with our Socioeconomic Data Center, who will show how to bring in multiple services to ArcGIS Pro Desktop to perform analysis. After Sri, we'll have Allison Alcott with the Goddard Earth Science Data Center, We'll be showcasing the use of an OGC web mapping service endpoint in QGIS to visualize data over time. And lastly, we'll have Patrick Ray, who will demonstrate global temperature data in a Jupyter notebook and using the GET capabilities. So we'll go ahead and start off with Heidi from the Alaska Satellite Facility. Thanks, Leah. The Alaska Satellite Facility archives a copy of the Global Seasonal Sentinel-1 Interferometric Coherence and Backscatter dataset, which is calculated from one year of data collected by the Sentinel-1 Synthetic Aperture Radar mission. We wanted to make this data easily accessible to a wide range of users, so we've published image services to Earth Data GIS for a number of the parameters in the dataset. You can find all of these image services by searching for GSSICB, in the Earth Data GIS portal. The first result is for our story map tutorial, which includes some background information about the data set and also links to web maps that allow you to interact with the data dynamically. This tutorial is also listed in the featured app section of the eGIS homepage. If you're not familiar with Esri web maps, there's a section in the story map tutorial that goes over how to interact with this data set effectively in a web map environment. I'll open the overview map, which includes all of the image services we've published for this data set, and I'll launch that in a new tab. You will see that there are quite a few services listed in the table of contents, including the median 12 day coherence, for both HH and VV polarization, as well as mean backscatter for all of the available polarizations. Each data type has a separate service for each season, and each service is generated from a mosaic of thousands of source rasters that are stored in the cloud. You can see that this one service provides access to more than 20,000 images. I'll turn off the backscatter layers as we'll focus on coherence data for this demo. I'll also turn off median coherence for the HH polarization, which is mostly over polar regions and oceans, and focus on the VV polarization, which provides coverage for most of the global land masses. This dataset was originally generated to help users determine which areas have Sentinel-1 acquisitions appropriate for interferometric SAR, also called INSAR. INSAR compares the phase measurements from two different acquisitions over the same location to identify and quantify surface deformation. The 12-day median coherence values are generated by using pairs of images acquired from the same place in space 12 days apart. We expect that areas with high coherence, which look bright in this map, would produce high-quality Sentinel-1 INSAR products, while areas with low coherence, such as this dark area over the Amazon rainforest, 
may not be suitable for INSAR analysis using Sentinel-1. I can click on some of these very dark pixels to see the pixel values contained in the source rasters. If I click through the information for each season, you can see that the coherence values are very low, regardless of the season. Coherence values range from 0 to 1, and values less than 0 0.1 are, are generally considered completely unsuitable for phase differencing, and many product projects would have a much higher threshold. So I can see just by exploring this web map that this area would be inappropriate for INSAR using Sentinel-1. Let's focus on France for a moment and explore a different application for coherence values. As I mentioned, there's a layer for each season for this data set. And if you look at the country of France during the winter, there's fairly high coherence overall. But that really changes as you move into the summer season. A lot of the country outside the major urban areas appears much darker in summer. The coherence values are much lower than they were in winter. This is common in areas that exhibit strong seasonality and contain significant agricultural regions or densely vegetated areas. Changes in the vegetation structure of crops, woodlands, and or orchards impact the way the radar signal interacts with the Earth's surface, making the phase measurements differ from one image to the next. This is also why we saw such low coherence in the Amazon. The rainforest canopy is always changing, resulting in strong phase decorrelation. In comparison, Urban areas display very little change in coherence from one season to the next, as cities tend to be more stable in structure. The SAR signal interacts with buildings in similar ways from one acquisition to the next, so those cities remain bright regardless of the season. So not only is coherence an indicator of whether INSAR is appropriate, it also indicates how dynamic the surface characteristics are in different locations and seasons. Many users may find the information they need just by exploring the web maps, but if you're interested in downloading the source data, you can zoom into an area of interest and click on the map to see the footprint of the source raster. The pop-up window displays the information about that source raster and a link that can be used to download it directly through your browser. This is an example of how Earth Data GIS image services can provide access to the information contained in tens of thousands of individual source rasters without having to download any of the data first. Now I'll pass it over to Sri, who will talk about using image services in ArcGIS Pro. Thank you, Heidi. Greetings, everyone. I am going to demo how to bring in socioeconomic data services published by CDAC in the Earth Data GIS portal into the ArcGIS Pro desktop application and do some visualization and analysis of the data. So at the Earth Data GIS portal, let's search for population. So we can type in population in the search box. and a list of results matching the population search will show up. Let's click on the PopCount web map and a description page will show. On the top right, click on ArcGIS desktop, desktop and open in ArcGIS Pro. A small file will download to, to your desktop. Open the folder where it's saved and double click on the, uh, on the file. When you double click, the population layer will show up in ArcGIS Pro. It will open up. Let's zoom into the South and Southeast Asian region and do an animation of the population's change using the time slider tool. And it will show the change from 2000 to 2020, 20 years span. And you can, uh, if you carefully observe, you can see the changes. Now, Let's add another la data layer to the map from the ArcGIS online portal and do some analysis. Switch, switch to the ArcGIS online portal and then select the living atlas. I'm now going to demonstrate two interesting use cases related to the recent wildfire in Northeastern Canada. Let's search for the living atlas for NASA fire 
and click on the MODIS thermal hotspots and fire activities layer and add it to the map. So the fires layer show up as dots, red colored dots. And it, this layer is from the 48 hours, uh, last 48 hours from a few weeks ago. And let's zoom and pan into the uh, fire area in, in Northeastern Canada. We are going to select the multidimensional option and use the temporal profile tool to create a chart showing how many people may be potentially affected by the wildfire in Northeastern Canada. On the chart tool, scroll down and set the spatial aggregation method as sum. So we are going to sum the population in our area of interest and then pan to the Northeastern Canada region where the cluster of fires are and using the polygon drawing tool, draw a polygon around this cluster of fires. Once we finish drawing the polygon, the chart will be created at the bottom of the screen here in your ArcGIS Pro showing the population from 2000 to 2020. If you mouse over the data points, you can see the population and roughly 27,000 people were exposed or affected by this fire in the Northeastern Canada. Let's label this uh, chart as wildfires in Canada. And now we will move on to another interesting use case to estimate how many people in the New York City area may be uh, exposed to the intense smoke coming down from the fire in Northeastern Canada. So let's using the polygon tool again, Let's draw a polygon around the New York City area. And once you finish drawing, the chart at the bottom will update, showing the population from 2000 to 2020. Let's label this as air quality in New York City. And we can also draw a trend line um, to see what is the general trend of population over the 20 years. And um, let's choose the red color there. It will show up as a red straight line showing the change. Now, if you mouse over the data points in 2020, you can see roughly 9.3 million people were in the New York City area who may have been potentially exposed to intense smoke. Thanks again. And I will now pass it on to Alison. Thank you, Sri. Um, before we start my demo, I'd like to um, define a few of the terms that are used uh, about this demo. The first one is OGC, and that stands for Open Geospatial Consortium, which is a group that has created an open standard for the creation of web services that can be used in any GIS software. WMS is one of the OGC standards, and that stands for Web Map Service, and that allows for the visualization of data sets without download. The EGIS portal has web map services available that correspond to the Arches image services and more will be introduced in the future. I will be completing this de demonstration in QGIS or Quantum GIS, which is a popular open source GIS software that can be used to view OGC services and other data products as well. It can also carry out analysis and create refined maps with multiple data layers. It is widely used, and as previously mentioned, it is the second most popular analytical software for NASA Earth Science data. Now we can begin the demo, and in this demo, we will be creating a simple map of Hurricane Harvey, which hit Texas in late August 2017. We, we will be using the iMERGE Early Precipitation Rate, WMS, in QGIS um, to show the precipitation rate. The service is hosted on the EGIS web portal at gis.earthdata.nasa.gov and it is labeled as WMS, so it is OGC compliant. Now, if we scroll to the bottom of the page, we can copy the URL and then go to QGIS. Use layer, add WMS, WMTS layer, and then click new and input the WMS link copied from portal. This can also be named and will create a service connection that is saved in the browser pane on the left and will be, you, you will be able to access it in the future without having to add the URL again.
So the layer is now in the browser pane and clicking on the layer, you can see it is time enabled as shown by the small clock symbol next to it and clicking on it adds this layer to the map. We will now add some spatial context by using a base map from the quick map services plugin, which can be added in the plugins menu. So click map and search quick map services. This accesses a variety of layers directly in QGIS, and today I will select the Esri World Topo base map because this is the most consistent with the default base map in the EGIS web portal. Others can be found using the search bar. This WMS is time enabled and can produce animations, dates, and times can be input at the top under the clock menu. Today, we're using the dates 824 to 828. 2017, um, and I will also select a daily time interval. This will show the evolution of Hurricane Harvey over Texas. We can watch the animation. Through this animation, you can see the spiral of the hurricane approaching Texas from the Gulf of Mexico and then expanding over Louisiana over the course of four days. This animation can also be saved using the save icon in the time settings menu. That was a brief walkthrough of using QGIS to view an OGC WMS. And now we will pass to Patrick who will demonstrate the use of Python with GIS. Thanks, Allison, and good afternoon, everyone. I will be walking us through a quick demonstration using NASA Earth Data Image Services in Python, focusing in on the prediction of worldwide energy resources, commonly known as power, and its annual meteorology data set. I will be primarily relying on the ArcGIS API for Python, but we'll take a moment to acknowledge some of the other potential libraries folks may utilize for visualization and analytics. Most workflows performed by other demonstrators prior to this demo today can be largely replicated programmatically in some way, shape, or form in their respective software or web platforms. Some services, such as, in the one, such as the one in the sample today, also have separate APIs that can be called upon using their own schema. For today's data demo, we will be taking a look at sea surface temperature at seven locations around the world and plot their data across over 40 years. We will do this by pinging the NASA Power Annual Meteorology data sets Earth skin temperature parameter, which I will now walk through using a Jupyter notebook. Getting started, we're going to take a look at the parameter information to familiarize ourselves with the structure of this data set. We collect multi-dimensional information from the REST endpoints capabilities using the Python library requests, which returns a JSON that has most of the numerical data in a non-geospatial format, including descriptive variable metadata, dimensions, and values. We start using requests for the sake of sampling some different ways to access this data. But this information could also easily be acquired using the ArcGIS API for Python to access the slices class of the imagery layer object, which we'll be doing again in a moment. Now let's parse through this information to make it a little bit more human readable. Here we dug up all the parameters with their long names and measurement units. The power project has both annual and monthly versions for a whole spread of climate, radiation, and meteorological parameters. Again, we'll be looking at Earth's skin surface temperature, known as TS from here on out. As we see in the data by building out another request URL, we have 41 slices starting in the early 80s. To find information on these years, we're going to query specific slices on the input out inputs outlined there, this time using our ArcGIS API for Python via that imagery layer object, which you can see the output of in that white below. Finally, we can get to querying the data that we need. We drill down to the appropriate slice information and slices, and then convert epic time to get our year and how we commonly reference it. The primary query we're going to be doing here is the identify function on the imagery layer as highlighted there, which is similar to what you would do in any Git capabilities identify function. We call the lats and lawns from our dictionary that we previously built, convert from Kelvin to Celsius, and make a quick data frame with our result data. Finally, we take this data and throw it into a matplotlib plot to see our results. Now, obviously this is a pretty cursory scan, but hopefully it gives an idea as to the potential of some of this data and where we could go from here to dig in more detail on specific areas of interest. 
Now I've alluded to a few other libraries that we can use to access this data. Here we use the ArcGIS API, which loads a lot of that REST endpoint information, but you could use the get capabilities from an image relay layer and could hard code requests just like as shown here, if you prefer to test this in a GUI before converting it over to Python. Here are a few additional access methods across web and software platforms that demonstrate the interoperability with several off-the-shelf and open source libraries. Modules such as ArcPy and QGIS can be used in, with their respective ArcGIS Pro and QGIS platforms. Data can also be loaded and filtered using pandas functions on GeoData frames via XArray or SQL functions if that is your preferred data access method. For all of these, Documentation and tutorials have been published with more in development as needed based on community feedback and challenges. With that, I will turn this back over to Genevieve to uh, give us a roadmap. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. All right, so I'm going to talk about the roadmap, and that includes what we have now, what's coming up next, sooner, later, and what our far off full vision is. Le Leah, there we go. Awesome. So, what's going on right now? We have approximately 60 image services that are currently available, most of which, if not all, have those OGC compliance services as well, so that you can get everything in your preferred format. All right, some of the stuff we have are those power projects, solar and meteorology annual and monthly, the global precipitation measurement, iMERGE, that Allison demoed, that global population that Shree demoed, and of course, those coherence data sets that Heidi demoed. We also have a space for the Earth Information Center, which has both the virtual space, which we host, as well as a physical space if you're ever at NASA headquarters in DC. We welcome you to check it out. All right, what's coming up next? Well, we're gonna have some global man-made impervious surfaces, some global dams and reservoirs, global annual PM 2.5 grids and aerosol optical depth, which you know might have been handy recently given uh, all the wildfire smoke that's been going around. We are also going to have some ozone monitoring instrument layers, and we're going to integrate with the VEDA project, which is a NASA visualization project that you can look uh, at. All right, some things that we're getting excited for are daily min-max temperature, vapor pressure, and other variables in the DayMet data set. We're also very excited about the land data assimilation systems, FLDAS and GLDAS data sets, which will have information about soil moisture, evaporation, and more. Some far, farther off items that we're looking for are some global human built up and settlement database extent, so HBase, a low elevation coastal zone, surface water and ocean topography SWAT hydrology layers, which are very exciting and coming out of the PO DAC uh, and JPL, some lightning imagery sensor data, and some radiometric ter terrain corrected SAR data. Say that fast. All right. What is this big vision that we're going for, though? I think that's the cherry on top of the Sunday for me. We're looking to get the most popular NASA Earth data collections at your fingertips in GIS native format. We want powerful, robust services that fuel your workloads because you shouldn't have to download the Earth just to do Earth science. We're looking to make those nice connections so we can, you know, have everything be streaming. All right. As a reminder, uh, you guys can look at this later. I think Jennifer's put links to where the webinar will be. So if you want to get information about the specific data sets later, look them up again. And with that, I am going to pop off back to Leah. Thanks, Genevieve. So we understand that NASA data can sometimes be a little complex and getting started might feel a little overwhelming. So to help you on your journey, I wanted to provide you some uh, resources to learn more about using NASA data and GIS tools. So the first is our Earth Data GIS page, which will be a starting point that offers various paths to get started. This will link you to data, tools, applications, services, and more. You'll also find a link to our thematic-based cross-stack web maps and apps, 
and also our Earth Data YouTube channel, which has an Earth Data playlist. From the main page, if you click the blue learn icon, you'll be bringing you to our GIS data backgrounder, which is geared towards newer beginner level audiences that provides an introduction to GIS through an earth observation lens. Next is our getting started icon, which will link you to our GIS data pathfinder. The pathfinder provides a guided walkthrough of NASA data and GIS tools. This resource provides links to tools from which data can be visualized, subset, and downloaded in different file formats, as well as a brief tutorial on using tools to access NASA's geospatial web services, following along to create various visualizations in tools such as QGIS and ArcGIS. This is part of a larger set of Pathfinder resources that are available through Earth Data. Pathfinders are thematic based guides to help users select application specific data sets and learn how to access and use them for various common workflows. Lastly, we have our Earth Data Forum, which was developed to engage subject matter experts from several NASA data centers to discuss general questions, research needs, and data applications. Here you have the capability to search by discipline, major project, in services and usage, for example, GIS tools. And users can query how to access and view and interpret the data, leveraging the powerful science community within NASA. This alleviates time and energy of working with complex data and allowing you to focus more on the research and analysis aspects of science. We encourage you to check these resources out as we will continue to update them with new content as it becomes available. We're eager to continue supporting you in this space and so with that, I'll turn it over to Allison on how to engage and provide additional feedback. Thank you so much, and thank you to you all for attending. We would like to hear more from you, especially if you're interested in the work that we have presented today. There are a few ways to get in touch. Please take a look at our portal at gis.earthdata.nasa.gov, or you can contact us at the email support at earthdata.nasa.gov. And we also have a questionnaire um, which is available at the QR code, and there will also be a link in the chat. Um, and in this questionnaire, you can tell us what data sets you'd like to see in the eGIS portal and what use cases and workflows you have for GIS services. Um, thank you so much for attending, and back to Jennifer. Okay, great. Thank you, Allison. At this point, let me go ahead and uh, grab the presenter role back and uh, and I'm going to open up the final polls and then we can jump directly to the Q&A here. All right, let's get started here. So we have had quite a few questions. Thanks for your patience on that. All right, you should see the new polls open right now and I am going to give these 20 minutes or so. All right, all, let's jump into the Q&A. So pretty early on, we had a, if you could just give me one moment to, just to address the, there have been a few questions about certificates for, of participation for our webinar series. We currently do not offer a certificate of participation. However, that is in development and within the next quarter, we will be offering certificates of participation. Okay. And so one of our first questions today here, let's see here. Um, so this question is for Heidi, and so the question was, does surface deformation include gases or things like glacial melting, deforestation, et cetera? Yeah, so in, INSAR can be used to monitor changes on the surface regardless of the cause. So basically it's just um, uh, measuring the distance, the difference in distance that the signal has to travel from one acquisition to the next. So anything that changes how far that distance is will be measurable um, as long as there's sufficient coherence for for that process. So um, groundwater subsidence, any, anything that, that makes the land kind of subside is picked up, um, volcanic inflations, any disruptions due to earthquakes that that make the, the earth move one way or the other. Um, so it's it's pretty widely applicable depending regardless of what's actually causing that surface deformation. 
Okay, thank you, Heidi. Okay, so there are a lot of the questions have actually been answered in the Q&A, so I'm going through the chat right now, if you can bear with me. Um, let's see here. Okay, so one of the comments was, I hope somebody builds a chart to show the features available with ArcGIS, the free version versus ArcGIS, the pro version versus QGIS, the open source. So it's not necessarily a question, but that's really excellent feedback. Um, regarding the question as to whether or not the recording will be available, yes, the recording will be available both to our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel, and I can add that to the chat another time, as well as to the webinars and tutorials page within NASA Earth Data. And so I will add that link as well. Um, okay, just going through the chat some more to see, and then I'll jump back over to the Q&A. Okay, and then there was a comment by one of our participants, if you wanted to speak to this at all. Um, Doug, I see that you're online. We have Doug Newman. Uh, he actually works for the ESDIS project. And if you have cloud computing questions, he's a great person to ask. Uh, so one of the comments was QGIS offers cloud native geospatial. That's promising. It could solve the barriers due to cost and near real time. So I don't know if you wanted to there's it's not necessarily a question, but perhaps if you wanted to say anything about our cloud capabilities, um, that could be useful. And I'm yeah, just sure. still scanning. Um, the, the primary motivation for uh, NASA Earth Data for going to the cloud was to uh, provide uh, equal access to. Uh, high performance computing environments uh, like AWS or um, uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Google Cloud, uh, in the cloud um, that are adjacent to the data uh, that they'll be operating on. So we have the Earth Data Cloud in the uh, currently in the US West 2 region of AWS. Um, so, in theory, you can spin up compute uh, in AWS in that region and be able to scale that out to whatever your uh, um, requirements are for your processing. And um, the references before to INSAR is a good use case uh, for doing this sort of processes in the cloud. INSAR requires a large amount of data, a large amount of processing. Um, and the cloud is uh, the cloud is very suitable for that. And not only that, you anybody can have access to that. Um, previously, um, high performance computing environments would be limited to say uh, universities or agencies and things like that, or business. Uh, with the advent of uh, commercial cloud vendors, then. Um, uh, the general public or the independent scientist or anybody um, can um, uh, leverage those resources and leverage those resources um, in a place that has easy and quick access to the data. Okay. Um, to, oh, and to add on to that, there was a question earlier about what this these services be free. Uh, it is NASA policy that all data access and access to these services like uh, um, gis.earthdata.nasa is free to the US taxpayer. An added bonus to that is that because it's not very easy to limit it to the US taxpayer, that everybody in the world gets free access to that as well. So, um, Everybody has free access to this data um, through uh, the services that GIS provides, so all the services on Earth Data Cloud, the data on Earth Data Cloud as well, uh, via traditional access methods and cloud native methods as well. Okay, thank you, Doug. So, one of the next questions 
had to do with whether or not we have near real time data. And uh, one of the participants, um, Janessa, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. You're right. Firms has to do with the near real time active fire and thermal anomaly data sets. However, we do have a land atmosphere near real time capability for EOS, which provides air quality data sets and other data sets that fall outside of the, you know, the fire uh, discipline. And so I can place that link in the chat again in just a moment. There is also a question about when will the uh, PM 2.5 layer be available? And I think that is getting back to the what is coming soon or coming in the future. Uh, Genevieve, if you could address that, that'd be fabulous. Thank you. Hi, yes. So uh, the PM 2.5 layer, we are expecting it to go live within the next quarter. Um, and then Shri at CDAC is one of the leads on that particular service. So, so he's a great person to reach out to if you've got questions about that. And then I think there was also a little uh, question about whether or not CDAC data is considered near real time or will ever be available in a near real time format. And Shri, I think since you're on, it would be great to have you address that. Uh, thank you, Genevieve. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Yes, PM 2.5 will be um, av available in the Earth Data GIS portal within the next quarter but uh, it will be historical data up to 2020, not near real time, which relates to or segue into the other question, whether CDAC data available in near real time. And given the nature of our data and how we develop and produce these data sets, socioeconomic data sets, unfortunately, it's very difficult to, at, at present time, it's very difficult to, produce them in a near real time basis. So there is some delay before the data is collected, synthesized, analyzed, and produced for uh, public access. So short answer is at present, we can provide the socioeconomic data in near real time, but maybe hopefully in the future, we can maybe using more satellite measurements to augment the uh, data input and so on. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Sri. Uh, there was another question about uh, when DayMet data will be available. Um, I don't remember if you mentioned that this was going to be added to this tool suite, but DayMet data is already available through our Oak Ridge National Laboratory DAC, and I can certainly um, place a link. Okay, go ahead, uh, Genevieve. Yes, you are. You're absolutely correct. Um, DayMet data is already available, and DayMet, a DayMet service, is in the works. Um, that's one of our medium-term uh, services that we're that we're looking to get up. So we're not expecting it in the next quarter, but we are expecting it. Um, I think by the end of the year. So that is. Uh, you know, if, if you need it now, please, please, please go to the ORNL, Oak Ridge National Laboratory Data Center, um, and you can download the data from there. If you're going to wait for us to build a service, uh, unfortunately, uh, it, it, it's not expected to be right around the corner, but, but we're on it. We hear you, and we're very excited that you're excited about it. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, and since I didn't... Let me wrapping up what I started. I just placed the direct link to the DayMet data access from Oak Ridge in the chat. So hopefully, Amanda, you can see that. Okay, let's see here. Just still trying to sort through the chat, and then we'll jump back over to the Q and A. So the next uh, comment is: I think the website needs a chat GPT type plugin so people can easily access the information that they need. That's a good suggestion. Okay, still. All right, so what kind of hydrological data will be available? Catchments, rivers, et cetera. Uh, 
Hi, so I think that a great uh, example of that is going to be our SWAT services that we're working on with the physical oceanography DAC. Um, and so those are surface water ocean topography uh, data sets, and we will have uh, streams and, and various other information uh, for that. Uh, the SWAT mission is new, so those uh, data sets and those uh, streaming uh, endpoint services are, are on the list, but again, they're, they're unfortunately not a right now. Um, but one thing to note is that almost every single data set that, that we are going to have as a service is also available for download and an Earth data search. So if, if you want something and you don't quite see it on the Aegis site, uh, one, please send us a note, let us know what you're interested in. And two, uh, go ahead and try search.earthdata.nasa.gov because it might be there. So it's, uh, it, it's kind of a great, great way. If you can't find it one place, go look at another and also let us know that you're looking for it as a service that so we, can, we can put it on a list or maybe bump it a little higher. Thanks so much, Genevieve. So one of the, and just getting back to the SWAT data, there actually is uh, some simulated SWAT data that's available, some test data for people to familiarize themselves with those forthcoming products. And so I will try to add that into the chat. Uh, once we wrap up with the Q&A, you can certainly feel free to, to reach out via email as well. The next question is, do you guys do any kind of training courses for the use of some of these products? And so I did notice that some responses were added. Um, we do offer, there are a number of different webinars and tutorials, uh, data recipes, there are GitHub uh, 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 resources where you can access uh, many different Jupyter notebooks, et cetera. So I think um, I'll try to provide a link to some of those, but you can certainly access uh, some of these resources simply by going to earthdata.nasa.gov. You're going to click on learn, and then you'll click on webinars and tutorials. And then I will try to add some of these again into the chat in a few minutes. Okay, so let's see. Okay, digital elevation model data. There is digital elevation model data available through our land processes data center. And you can, there was a comment made that, you know, we should not necessarily be referring to all of these data uh, by the source of the data in terms of the data center. And so you can also search by theme and discipline at earthdata.nasa.gov and kind of drill down to those uh, data products that you're looking for, rather than having to know which DAC might hold those products. And so that is really good feedback. I appreciate it. Okay, so let me see, just scrolling down a bit more. Ah. Okay, are there services for precipitation forecasts? Uh, certainly precipitation data is available. Um, I don't know if uh, Allison, if you wanted to say a few words about this. I mean, we've got our near real time iMERGE data. You know, our data products are used as input for uh, weather forecasts with our partner agencies for sure. Um, yeah, I definitely. Anybody want to add to this a little bit? Okay. Jennifer, there is near real time data. I'm not sure about forecasted data um, that we have. Okay, and we can follow up with you offline as well. Okay, so let's see. Do you provide global evapotranspiration data on the platform or some that contribute to attaining it? Um, I will let someone else from the Aegis team speak about on the platform. However, uh, yes, we do have EcoStress evapotranspiration data products. Um, and again, <laughs> Here I'm going to be referring back to a DAC, but I think what I'll try to do is, you know, provide a link uh, to these things. And unfortunately, I really can't do that until after we've managed the the Q and A in the chat. So thank you so much for for that question. 
Um, and there are a number of uh, data recipes for working with those data products as well that our land processes um, discipline data center has uh, created. Okay, let's see. All right, so the next question is going to be a few, well, it's, it's really a comment combined with a question. A few years ago, I was able to call the ArcGIS ArcPy library from notebooks in my Anaconda environment. But now with QGIS, GIS, excuse me, I just can call routines from QGIS's internal Python console, but not from notebooks from Anaconda. Any advice to check? Good afternoon. I can take that one real quick. Um, I've, you can certainly see uh, there that I have had those issues as well, um, but it is generally an environment issue. Um, whenever I'm working in Anaconda, I generally make several different environments, whether that be one for Python 2 and ArcMap, uh, Python 3 for ArcGIS Pro, and then separately for QGIS. Um, but that is a common workflow, and thank you for the feedback that that's a challenge we can Work to potentially make some documentation around that. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to jump back over to the Q and A for a moment, and then back over to chat. So, one of the questions in the Q and A, uh, again, the presentations will be made available. I'll send an email to all registrants. So, if you have colleagues who weren't able to make it today, they will still receive an email with a link to the recording as well as to the presentation slide deck and demo. Uh, and demos. Uh, it'll also be available on our NASA Earth Data YouTube channel as well as on the NASA Earth Data website under Learn and Webinars and Tutorials. Generally, that will take a couple of days. There's a bit of uh, post processing that's involved with the webinars. The next question is a question for me Can this webinar be promoted via local social media to participants of the upcoming NASA International Space Apps Challenge Hackathon? Please, yes. Um, in fact, we do have two, a NASA Earth Data Twitter and Facebook account, and I, you are welcome to promote this content out, and I will be promoting it out via our channels as well. So thank you for that question. Okay, the next question is, uh, and then back to the chat, because I could see that there are quite a few more. If you have questions, please enter those into the Q&A. That would be very, very helpful. Next question in the Q&A, a general question. What do you propose for the countries that are lagging behind in the GIS field? you repeat that one more time, Jennifer? Of course. So the question was, as a general, as a general question, what do you propose for the countries that are lagging behind in the GIS field? If that's in terms of training, um, I would say that there's a lot of opportunities to engage specifically with NASA. There are also um, programs within NASA that are geared towards capacity building um, that have programs um, focused in developing countries. So I can shoot out a website for um, NASA's Applied Sciences Program, which does have that capacity building area, um, and that is their sole purpose, is just how to build that capacity within these different uh, spaces that may not have the same level of resources as, you know, people um, within like ESA, Europe and, and America with NASA. So I will shoot over those resources. They also do provide um, a large training program uh, for learning more about remote sensing in general, which has geospatial technology built into many of those um, opportunities, and they are all openly, freely available to anyone. So. I would suggest looking into that space a little bit more, and I'll send that in the chat. Okay, excellent. I Thank you, Leah. I on to that was suggesting that um, you leverage resources that um, are free. Uh, although Arctis does have a cost associated with it, QGIS is a free open source uh, product. Also, um, somewhat contrary to uh, um, intuition, these uh, uh, cloud services uh, can afford um, advantages to underserved communities. Um, 
for example, uh, in some areas, your internet service provider might not be as reliable as you would need to download these uh, data sets or execute on these services. Whereas um, rather than um, using local resources like your laptop or uh, desktop computer, you could use these cloud services to, uh, to leverage these GIS systems. Uh, an environment that doesn't suffer from that reliability issue. And although there's a cost associated with that, a lot of these uh, um, cloud providers to uh, outreach to these communities in the um, form of uh, free credit um, for using their services. So leveraging those as well may help you um, uh, decrease that gap, which I, I think you were referring to in the use of the word lag. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Uh, so the next question here. Okay, we've got, uh, I guess there's a couple of different um, pieces to it. Okay, so I'm using MATLAB to look at tropospheric ozone and I have identified data from Sentinel-5 and TEMP. Uh, any suggestions as to how I may best, as to how may I best use the data to transform it and make it accessible and usable with MATLAB? And uh, this user has provided his or his email address, so we can certainly uh, follow up offline. Uh, we are a group of high school teachers at NSF funded RET program, and we were creating opportunities to have students use data during class. I, I think, you know, pulling together some resources. Um, this might be well suited for an email, but if anybody had anything they would like to contribute toward this question about how to best make use of the data to transform it and make it accessible and usable with MATLAB, if anybody had any um, input. If not, we can address it via email. We can move on to the next. Not MATLAB, but I will also send in the chat, um, since it was uh, related to education, our program, My NASA Data, um, really great program that leverages um, geospatial technology in the form of story map collections, if you're looking for GIS-centric um, use cases, but they do a lot of really great lesson plans at various levels of K through 12 to um, take small kind of subsets of earth science related phenomena or systems and dive into it a little bit more and letting uh, both students and educators um, try their hand at, you know, actually doing data downloading, transformation, science, um, and then sharing those outcomes. So I will send that out in the chat as well. Okay, thank you, Leah. So the next question is, what method can one use to detect flood water on a previously dry land surface using satellite imagery? That may be something we really need to follow up with offline here. Okay, let's see here. What are we looking at? Okay, so one of the one of the questions. Um, Okay, yes, Genevieve. You could just go ahead and unmute Genevieve um, to address awesome, the question. Um, as far as detecting floods, um, we can definitely follow up offline, but I will also point you to the NASA Disasters Team. They are an applied sciences program who respond to disasters in the US and also around the world with data and workflows. And um, they are a great resource if you're looking to, to monitor an area or if you're looking to set up a pre-existing relationships so that when a disaster strikes, you can reach out to them and say, hey, can we get that data we talked about? Um, so they're, they're a, a good place to start. Okay, thank you. Let's see here. She's trying to scroll up. Yes, I should include, you know, some of the emails for addressing the questions in the chat. I'll try to include those um, when I send out the email for the recordings so that everybody can benefit from the answers here. Okay, just looking through here. 
Yes, okay, so bear with me just a moment. There was another, ah, okay. Is there a NASA Earth Data Git location for repositories? I've only found some specific to some locations and or scientists that prepare things like Jupyter Notebooks and such, but would be so much easier with an overarching Git site to watch for updates. I think you're well, right. A, oh, go ahead. There is a NASA GitHub site. Um, by definition now, um, all of NASA's projects um, that involve code um, need to be open sourced. And um, our um, repository of choice is generally GitHub. Um, there are some uh, barriers in uh, getting these things open source as, source as quickly as possible um, for, in terms of um, the, the federated way that we go about doing our work between different organizations and um the licensing agreements there so it's it can sometimes be a process but ultimately everything um will end up on that uh um nasa github site or one of the other organizations um within nasa so there is a nasa uh as this uh git repo as well um which um has um code and tutorial uh, will have code and tutor tutorials associated with uh, uh, NASA Earth data. There's also the uh, OpenScapes project, which provides um, tutorials for uh, utilizing uh, NASA, uh, NASA Earth science data on the cloud. Uh, but you are right, there is having an uh, overarching umbrella over this stuff in terms of a Git organization is a bit of a challenge because of the federated way that NASA does its work. Thank you, Doug. And I did actually um, put the, before you mentioned the Earth Data Cloud Computing uh, Cookbook GitHub page, I have that in the chat for those of you who might be interested, but, it, but it's true that there's no one singular centralized location where all of these various data recipes reside. It's true that for the most part, they're organized by their discipline specific um, data centers. I expect that will change moving forward. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> all right, let's see. Just looking to see if there's. Okay. I think I've covered everything in the chat. Let's jump back to the Q&A. We've got about six minutes left for the Q&A. <clears throat> uh, the extended Q&A. I don't think I have missed any questions. I'm just sorting back through. I don't see any new questions. Um, what I will do uh is leave the virtual meeting space open after if there are no further questions i will log off from the audio component but i'll leave the virtual meeting space open an additional 10 minutes from end time and so if you think of something or you have additional questions please feel free to enter those into the chat and uh, i or the q a and uh, our speakers will be able to follow up with you offline all right, let me do another scan in the chat. I don't. Uh, okay. Yes, yeah, so this is a question um, and it might be too in depth to get into during the webinar, but Heidi, if you wanted to I don't know if you addressed this in the chat, but there was a question about, was just wondering if there are any suggestions for best practices detecting natural slicks and phytoplankton blooms using SAR and ocean color. So for ocean color data, uh, you can access that at uh, oceancolor.gsfc.nasa.gov, but for SAR data, I will defer to Heidi to see if she has any input she'd like to provide. Oh, I, I missed that question. Um, no, that sounds 
quite interesting. I am not sure there uh, it would depend on how the slick interacts with the surface of the water. So it is often possible to detect oil slicks by um, using SAR data because it it the oil in, changes the way that the wind and um, currents interact with the the surface. So it, it it makes a change there. So it's it's possible depending on the size of the slick. Um, but I I don't have any direct experience with with that. But it sounds like a really intriguing um, line of questioning. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Just looking one more time. All right, I think that is going to cover it. I'd like to um, thank our Q and A panelists, Doug Newman, and to thank all of our seven speakers for your uh, contributions and your presentation content this afternoon. And thank all of you for joining us from all over the world. We really appreciate it. We actually have a a webinar next week, just to put a plug in for this, uh, which will focus on NASA's EMIT mission. So that is studying Earth's mineral dust from arid mission, excuse me, arid regions and the impact on Earth's climate and other systems. And so you can find uh, information about that or to register at earthdata.nasa.gov. And if you kind of scroll down to the news section, you, it's probably the third or fourth entry there, but I'll put the registration information uh, in the chat as well. Um, we will have members from the EMIT science team on board, and they're going to talk about the mission, its measurements, uh, some of the applications, and then go through a series of data discovery and data access um, tutorials. All right, well, thank you all very, very much with that. Uh, any final comments from our speakers? We'll log off from the audio component and leave this opened for another 10 minutes. Thanks, everyone. Oh. Bye. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, so much. Thank all, you right. all. Good time. All right. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Goodbye now.